our week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our hymn, 345. scribe during Jesus' day said there's no way. At least not this guy here. This guy here is Jesus of Nazareth. I know this kid. He's Joseph's son. They're both carpenters. Now you're telling me that this guy is supposed to be my savior? No. Plus, Jesus is always talking about heaven and hell and all this spiritual mumbo-jumbo. And I, that's not what we're looking for. We need a, a savior from the Roman Empire. This guy's got no power. He's got no money. And he looks just like I do. No, not, not this guy. There's got to be somebody better who's coming. A few decades later, the Greek philosopher had a similar sentiment. He said it didn't make any sense. So let me get this straight. 10, 20 years ago, this guy named Jesus lived. He was tried as a common criminal. He was found guilty, and then he was put to death on the cross. And he's supposed to be my Savior? Yeah, you know that doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, that, that, spells, that spells defeat, not victory. And now you're telling me that this guy supposedly rose from the dead, and that's how I get to heaven? Are you stupid or something? This doesn't make any sense at all. See, these two groups, and many like them, thought they, they had it all figured out. They thought they knew better. And if that was the case back then, that's certainly the case today, right? People think they've got it figured out. People think they know better. Consider the scientific genius who thinks he's disproven the Bible. And then he is dis dismayed and, and can't understand why we would still worship something that's been disproven. What are you guys, stupid or something? And it shouldn't surprise us. The Bible, the Bible even tells us the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So if they have that part figured out, they must have us figured out too, right? And I want you to ponder that for a couple minutes today. 
what do people think when they find out you go to FEL? What do people think about your parents when they find out they send you here and spend thousands of dollars to do it? Teachers, what do people think of you when they find out you teach at Fox Valley Lutheran High School? And certainly we have a good academic reputation here. I think Mr. Preby would back me up on that. When, when most people think of FEL, probably one of the first things that comes to their mind is that that's a good academic institution. We consistently test higher than, than is the average. Thanks to Mr. Sharon and all the work they're doing in guidance, we have all sorts of programs that are offered to all sorts of different learning styles. Many of you will enter four-year colleges and some will go beyond that. But I want you to, to think about FEL without the academic standard there. Take the academics out of it. And what goes through someone's mind when they find out you are involved with FEL? A couple of weeks ago, I was back here one night for a basketball game. And I was back in my office for just a little bit, and my office shares a, a wall with the visitor's locker room. So I try to stay out of there as much as possible when games are going on, because I usually hear things that I don't want to hear. But for whatever, for whatever reason, I was back in my office that particular night for 30 seconds or so to drop something off, pick something up, it doesn't matter. But I did hear a group of players in the midst of a conversation on the other side of the wall. And it didn't take me long to hear this. Man, FEL is weird. FEL is weird. And to be honest with you, it kind of ticked me off at first. I wasn't real happy about it. But the more I've thought about it, the more it makes sense to me. You know what? FEL maybe is a little bit weird. And you know what? He probably isn't the only person who thinks that about FEL. There are probably many people, many outsiders that think, man, FEL is weird. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? That people see you as being strange, that people see you as being weird. But again, so it should not surprise us. Take a quick mental tour with me of our, of our school building. And as we take this mental tour, I want you to take note of the, the objects and the things that are around our school that an outsider might see as maybe a little bit ridiculous, maybe a little bit weird. Start in the large gym. We have a gigantic cross on one wall. That, that's unusual. That's different. That's strange. It's weird. Some would even say it's idiotic. Some probably want nothing to do with it. What about this particular scene taking place right now? If someone walked through those back doors, had no idea what that feel was about, and just started observing, don't you think he would think this was a little bit strange? Okay, this isn't a, a regular school assembly. It's just people sitting and hopefully halfway listening to the person on stage person on stage seems to be talking about sin and grace and this Jesus character quite a bit. So you do this four times a week? Yeah. Well, what do you do the other day? Well, on Wednesdays, we, after the second hour, we stay in our classrooms and the teachers, they, they lead us in a Bible study. Really, five days a week you do that? Yeah. Dang, a little strange. But that's just the beginning. He starts to look at the school schedule. It doesn't take him long to notice something else. And he asks about it. He says, so... Everybody here has to take religion class? Yeah. Like one religion class? No, every, every year we take one. So let me get this straight. You, see, you sit in Jesus class for 45 minutes every single day for four years? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but are you stupid or something? You really do that? Isn't it boring? Don't, don't you know that this stuff has been disproven? Don't, don't you know it doesn't make logical sense? And then he starts to walk around the school. And he sees Bible passages plastered everywhere. And he sees crosses in, in every single classroom. And he thinks, man, this, this place is kind of weird. Because everywhere you go in our building, there are signs of who we are and what we do and what we teach. What if we took a personal spiritual tour of your own 
spiritual buildings. Would we see a, a building that is stock full of, of symbols of Christ? Or would we see a, a building that is void and bare of anything that is Christ-like, anything that resembles Christ in any way? Students, would we see somebody who lacks character and integrity any time an adult is out of earshot? Students, would we find somebody who just keeps it hush-hush a little bit, don't want to cause any waves, so I'll just kind of go all along with the crowd? Would we find somebody whose spiritual building accept, accepts seemingly unquestioningly the worldviews of today just because, well, it, it seems loving to me or it makes logical sense in my mind? Teachers, how about you? If we took a tour of your own spiritual building, teachers, what would we see? Would we see hypocritical teaching that, that tells our students the importance of God's Word, and then we fail to find the time to study God's Word in our personal lives? Would we find a teacher who, who was so locked into teaching social studies or Spanish or English, but fails to bring in God's Word to any of our lesson plans? Would we find a teacher who, and, and God forbid when this happens, and, and shame on us and shame on me when this happens, but would, when we, would we find a teacher that puts all of his heart and soul and energy and emotion into an extracurricular that it overshadows the mission of the school and becomes our own personal God? What do your spiritual buildings look like? Students, I have a question for you. And I want you to answer it if, if you know it. Can anyone recite for me the FEL mission statement? Hands out there? I don't see anybody raising their hands. Teachers, I'm not going to ask you because I don't want to embarrass you. Here's what it is. Fox Valley Lutheran High School, in partnership with families and federation churches, provide students with Christ-centered education, preparing teens for lives of service and for eternity. That's our school's mission. Notice what wasn't in there. What wasn't in there is we will strive to have the best fine arts program in the Fox Valley because it doesn't matter. What's not in there is that we will strive to push out, uh, churn out the, the best and brightest students in the state and send them to the best colleges. Because it doesn't matter. What's not in there is that we will strive to have the best sports programs this side of Kimberly. Because it doesn't matter. You know what is in, is in there? Christ-centered. And what else is in there? Lives of service for eternity. Because those are the things that matter. Those are the things that make, it, make us different. Those are the things that make us weird. And that's okay. That's fine. Because if we weren't those things, we wouldn't be any different than Little Shoot or Freedom or any other Appleton area high school. But we are different. We are strange. And, and you know what? That's good. Because I want a God who knows more than I do. I want a Savior who's more loving than I am. I want a, a, a Father who has the entire picture in mind while I walk around with blinders on. So, Mr. Granberg, I'd like to suggest a change to the school mission statement, at least for the next five minutes, if I may. May we change the school mission statement to four simple words. We preach Christ crucified. That's it. Four words. We preach Christ crucified. Because that is at the heart and soul of what we do. We are not just an academic institution. We first are a, a ministry, then we are an academic institution. And if we don't have that message at the heart and soul of everything that we do, what are we doing here? What are we listening to? We might as well shut the doors down and we'll 
disperse everybody to these other schools because we would be no different. But that is at the heart and soul of everything that we do. We preach a message of a Savior who took our spot. He willingly lived his life. He went to death on a cross for you, for me. He wanted to do those things. He did die on the cross. He did rise from the dead. And that's what we preach. And that's what we believe. Because that's the only thing that matters. Consider this. Can you take the A in honor psych and give that to God at, at, at heaven and say, hey, does this get me in? Of course not. How about the all-conference uh, certificate in, in girls' soccer? Take that certificate up to heaven and say, here you go, God. Got all-conference, girls' soccer. Can I come in now? That's kind of dumb. Well, those things don't get us to heaven. And if those things don't matter in the long run, there's only one thing that does. That message that we have, the one thing that is needful, the one thing that is foolishness to so many others, that message of Christ crucified. So we can't take our 837 Vex Robotics trophies up to heaven and use one to get in. It's not going to work. But faith given to us from the Holy Spirit and that message of Christ crucified? Absolutely. That's the only thing that matters. So pursue education, by all means. Be involved in extracurriculars. Those are good things. But we don't let those get in the way of the one thing that actually matters. The message of Christ crucified. And all of the knowledge in the world could not do that for us. Yeah, yeah we're, getting, we're getting smarter as a society. They say we're smarter now than, than any generation before us. We have knowledge at our fingertips. But even if we gained everything, it still wouldn't matter because all the knowledge and the wisdom that the world has doesn't matter. And they can't tell us how to get to heaven. Not even Siri can do that. Let's just double check to make sure. Hey Siri, tell me about heaven. Here's some information. Okay, this is interesting. Uh, British male Siri here has just given me some information about Beyonce. Uh, quick word co correlation here, heaven, Beyonce, heaven, Beyonce, it's not usually, not usually what I think of when I think of heaven. So maybe my word choice is just off. Let's try it again. Hey, Siri, how do I get to heaven? All right, here's what I got. Hmm. Uh, British male Siri, thanks man, hey, he's giving me directions to soccer heaven on the south side of Appleton. Can't answer my question. Siri has all of, all of the knowledge in the world available to him, or her, depending on which version you have. Can't answer my question. Doesn't give me the one thing that I need. The only thing that can is God's word. And specifically this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the message of, cross is, of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, 
and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Let's pray. Our crucified and risen Savior, help us to live the words of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. The commands of the Lord are radiant, by them is your servant taught. In keeping them there is great reward. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. Amen. And receive the blessing. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all of our human understanding, bless and keep you. Amen.